Well, we grew up, grew up in Portland, Oregon, um, son of a uh, torpedo bomber off of the U.S. Uh, uh, Enterprise and, and uh, Intrepid. Uh, my father won the Navy Cross. For all you Navy people, my father won the Navy Cross when he was in the service. A very heroic guy. I was born an Episcopalian. My father uh, taught Sunday school, so we were raised in a very uh, strict but respectful way. And that really translated to the golf course for me. Everything that I learned from my father was about respect and respect your, your elders, respect others, treat people the way you wish to be treated. And it worked perfectly for me on the golf course because we, our father threw us into the situations on the golf course where he said, if you can learn, if you can get along with people on the golf course, you can get along with people anywhere. So we, uh, we started out as caddies. First had to learn the game how to, through the caddy process. So we learned the etiquette, we learned the rules, we learned how to tend the flag, we learned how to mark the ball, we learned everything about the game of golf before we could play. And I really kind of saw the game of golf as a metaphor for life because when we play golf, we start on the first tee, we play 18 holes, you finish, you, you review the day, you kind of figure out what you did wrong or you did right, and then you start the next day, the next round all over again. And, uh, and I always feel like that um, always prepared me for life on the PGA Tour because it's a grind. There's no question. The easiest part of playing the tour is getting, uh, is, is the golf. The first tee to the 18th green is the easiest part because it's golf. The hardest part is getting from the 18th green the night before to the first tee the next morning. Uh, that's when the decisions of your life come into play. That's when you decide whether you go home and uh, order room service and watch television or do you go out and you put on your party shoes and you carouse and you go, uh, go, go crazy, and you're drinking and chasing and doing all those problems. That has derailed a lot of talent on the PGA Tour, and I'm sure in professional sports, I I've, I've hear these stories all the time. So my background uh, from my father as a, as a proud serviceman and uh, a religious man, man of faith that our whole family is, uh, really helped me when I embarked on a PGA Tour career. The usual suspects, players like Ricky Fowler, Jason Day, young man from Japan named uh, Hideki Matsuyama. These, the players today, uh, Jordan Spieth, I could, I could list 10 to 12 players that are incredible players, but more importantly, I, I look at them as individuals because I think the success that you have on the golf course is predetermined by how you approach your life and how you, how you take care of your business off the golf course. And that's where the most successful people are, I find. Um, and we can talk about professional football, we can talk about baseball, basketball, it doesn't matter. If you've got your life in order, if you have great faith, if you've got uh, love for your family, if you want to protect your family, you also want to protect your legacy and protect your, your career. Because we've seen so many careers derailed by bad decisions, bad judgment. And there are so many kids today on the tour that have followed the lead of people like Arnold Palmer and, and Jack Nicklaus and Gary Player, that the kids coming up today are, are, are special guys. And uh, hey, we all have our favorites, we all want them to win, but at the end of the day, I like to see how they handle themselves in the post-round interviews, the pre-round pre interviews, how are they in the pro-ams, what do they do to their fellow man and the kids coming up that really want to learn from them. So, Tour is in good place. The world of golf is in, good, is, in a, is in a good place. The reason it's been so successful is, as a senior player, I'm 61 years old now, I long gave up trying to impress people with my golf. I gave that up a long time ago. I've already, oh, I've already so, done. So did, by the way, everybody. In <laughs> I don't know if that makes sense to you, but, but once, once you reach that point as a tour player where you think, okay, I'm not going to win on the PGA Tour anymore. I, that's passed me by. I'm looking forward to the Champions Tour. I'm looking forward to going out and playing with my pals. I play with Fred Couples and, and Jay Haas and uh, John Cook and John Harris. And you go on and on, Bobby Clampett, down the, down the line. These are the guys that I cut my teeth in the, on the PGA Tour with. It succeeds because everybody on the Champions Tour that's out there appreciates the fact that 
they've played golf for 20 or 30 years professionally. We've all been able to chase our dreams these, these years. And when I play with four players in a pro-am, we're out there just sharing thoughts about golf, about family, about life, about our faith, about problems in the world. I find it seems to me that whenever I play a pro-am with the group, we end up talking less about golf and more about life and more about family and things like that in the world, uh, that's, that's current events, that to me, I have more fun in a pro-am now than I do playing with Jake Haas and Fred Couples. I don't think in golf you're ever satisfied. And I don't know if I can speak for everybody here, but I'm leaving tomorrow to go to Hawaii for the first term of the year, the Mitsubishi Electric, and I'm thinking, what do I need to do to win? Do I have to win? No. Do I want to win? Oh yeah, I want to win so badly. But you're never satisfied in the game of golf. When I look at my highlights, I look at more of my fun lights. I look at more of the things that I did that were so much fun when I won at Pebble Beach. I remember the most exciting thing about winning at Pebble Beach was playing with Jack Lemon, the late great actor, incredible guy. I played with Jack in the tournament and Clint Eastwood handed me the trophy on the 18th green. That was the coolest thing in the world. <laughs> coolest thing in the world. The other great moment happened out there at Pebble Beach. Did he tell was, you that you made his day? He said, <laughs> he said, you made that putt there to win the tournament. <laughs> we were playing one year, it was Jack Lemon and myself playing with Clint Eastwood and Greg Norman, the great white shark. We were playing Cypress Point. And th I'll never forget this, and if you're ever playing Cypress Point, you can look and there's a picture of this on the wall. We were on the world famous 16th hole, the par three, where you play from one side of the, the rocks across the ocean to the other side, it's a par three. Greg and I had hit our shots on the green, but Lemon and Eastwood cannot reach the green in one, so they had to lay up to the left, which they did. Eastwood laid up successfully, he found turf. Lemon made it, but he found the ice plant. So as we walked around, Eastwood hit his shot on the green. We walked over, now this ice plant was hanging over the edge of the cliff, about 80 feet straight down to the ocean. So as we walked over, I was on the green putting for birdie and, and Lemon just said, yeah, you know, your whole partner. That was maybe one of the few times all day that I heard that, your whole partner. <laughs> so I said, sure, let's just pick your ball up. I said, in fact, just let it go because it's hanging over the cliff and Clint Eastwood says, you, you can't let that go, that son of a you gotta play that son of a <laughs> So Jack, Jack grabs his wedge and goes, oh, I can hit that. He was laughing, thinking it was a great joke, and I said, ooh, this is a bad idea, because that is slippery, it's, ice plant is slick, you're gonna go right down to the bottom of the, the cliff down there, right onto the rocks. So Clint said, I, I got, don't worry about it, I got it. So as, as Lemon starts walking over the edge of the cliff, down like this, Eastwood grabs the back of his belt, and Eastwood goes to me. So I grab the back of Clint's belt, Norman grabs the back of my belt, and Norman's caddy, Pete Bender, grabbed the back of his belt. So we're all joined now, and Lemon's looking back, laughing, you can't believe. So he's going like, a little more, a little, a little more, a little more, as literally he's looking over the edge of the cliff, and we're like, oh God. So he takes this mad swing with a wedge, slashes out of the ice plant, the ball miraculously pops out about 40 yards. And Eastwood, we all pull back and Jack literally almost falls back on his, on his backside. We're laughing, high-fiving, Lemon is having so much fun. Cameras are snapping and that picture is on the wall in the locker room at Cypress Point. In fact, they always run it on CBS. It was, run, it was obviously broadcast by CBS and Venturi and Summerall back at the time. But those are the moments that I remember. Um, I'm not egotistical enough to think, well, when I made the four-footer to save par at the Bay Hill Classic on number 12 to stay three back of the lead, that, that's, not, that's not me. When I first met Payne Stewart, <laughs> We, uh, he, he didn't have his card for the first couple of years and he played in Europe, played in Europe, played in Australia, played in Asia. And it was kind of a defining moment for him. He came, we played in the Buick Open in Flint, Michigan. And we were paired, it was Curtis Strange, Payne Stewart and myself. And we showed up on the first tee and all three of us were wearing khaki slacks and a white shirt. 
and we're on the 12th, I'll never forget this, we were on the 12th green at Warwick Hills. And Ch Curtis was chipping, Payne was standing there, I was standing there, and he looked at me and he looked at Curtis, he said, look at the three of us, we look exactly the same. We, nobody can tell us apart. And I said, well, yeah, but you can tell by the score or something like that. And he goes, I'm not gonna let that happen again. Well, that year, he went back home. He married a, a girl, Tracy, Tracy Ferguson from Australia. So he always went back and visited her, her, her family back in the country. He came back the next year and he looked like the NBC peacock. <laughs> he came back, he had the knickers, the plus fours, they were pink. He had yellow socks. He had a purple and red shirt and he had some orange hat. And he looked like he had just fallen out of a, paint, a Pittsburgh paint can. I mean, he looked like a double scoop from Baskin Robbins. And he showed up and we were all floored. We went, what rainbow threw up on you? I mean, it was, we didn't know. And he said, this is me, this is my unique look. So for about three years, he took major heat from everybody on tour, everybody, from Nicholas Palmer on down. But he lived it, he owned it, and that's what we remember pain for now. As from the outside, that's what we remember pain for. But pain early on was a real troubled guy. He was, he was a real dichotomy. He was not a man of faith early on. He really had to work to find who he was. And he found it through God. He found it through his faith. And, but it was a long, long time for him to find it. And the real sad th part about that is as he raised his children, as his kids became eight, nine, ten years old and he came to God, he really found himself. I think he became a better player. He became a better person. He became a better father, a better man. And that's the guy that we all want to, want to remember. In fact, I'll never forget when Paul Azinger had his cancer bout. And Paul, we all thought we were going to lose Paul. And there was, a lot of, there was a lot of troubling times while Paul was going through his chemotherapy treatments. Payne would go visit every moment that, that he had off in Orlando. They both lived in Orlando at the time. Paul uh, was from Bradenton, Florida, just north of us here. But every time Payne had an opportunity, he would call Paul or go see Paul. And even to the point where he flew Paul out on a private jet, Paul was very weak going through chemotherapy. And we were at the Memorial Tournament in Columbus, Ohio. Ohio. It was in Ohio, a small state up there. And he brought Payne, he brought, Payne brought Paul out and we were all, we used to go to this place called Damon's Ribs and watch all the big screens there in Columbus. It was during the, during the, the, the playoffs, the NBA playoffs. And he put, he put Paul at a table, a big long table, and we all just kind of showed up and ate ribs and watched golf, and, or watched basketball and went home. And he came in one time and nobody knew it was Paul. We all sat down and we're talking to everybody. We realized there was this real skinny, bald-headed, white, pasty guy that was sitting there. And Paul took his hat off and said, Hey guys, don't you recognize me? And it was Paul. And oh my gosh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the fellowship that out, was, was outpouring for Paul the entire weekend, he stayed there for three, four days while he was going, undergoing his chemo, was incredible. But Payne did that for all of us, but he did it for Paul and he did it for himself as well. But Payne was, um, and then to tragically lose Payne, kind of a, a, kind of a scary story too. I was, I was going from Vegas to do an outing with Arnold Palmer in Pinehurst. And GTE had sent an airplane for me, a private plane to take me from Vegas to Pinehurst. Well, as we're up in the airplane, the landing gear wouldn't lock, so we flew around, dumped fuel, and we had to, we had to do a, you know, one of those emergency landings in Fayetteville, North Carolina, which we did, and the landing gear didn't lock, and we went down, and the plane spun around. They foamed the runway, and we finally got out, but it was a harrowing time for me. I didn't know if I was gonna survive. And about a week later, I played a practice round with Payne at Disney World, and I told him this story. And he said, I'm never getting on another private airplane unless I know the pedigree. Unless I know the mechanical history, I'm not getting on an airplane. A week later, he got on that airplane from Orlando, going to Houston with a, with a, uh, a stop in Dallas to look at a piece of land to build a golf course. 
So that haunts me all the time. I think about that, my accident, and then what happened to Payne. And I think about the unrealized dreams that Payne had with his kids and his wife, Tracy, who she's never dated, never remarried, uh, still remains very close with my wife and I. And his daughter, Chelsea, is an amazing young woman, works for the PGA Tour. If you've ever seen pictures or video of Chelsea, she has Payne's spunk. She has his personality. She is an incredible young lady. Beautiful girl. I mean, m model beautiful. She could be, she could model, she'd be on the front of any, any magazine. And his son, Aaron, is a spitting image of Payne. Uh, he works for a company called Diamond Resorts, uh, works, uh, works in the resort business uh, in projects all over the world. So Payne's legacy lives on with his kids, but uh, we always talk about it. Zing Azinger and I talk about it. A lot of his friends um, that you, you uh, probably wouldn't be familiar with, uh, some tour players that he became close friends with. We talk about Payne all the time, about, about what he was, what he became, and what he would be today, would he, would he still be alive.